Um, thanks, thanks to everyone for coming here. Uh, this is Jing Yao, today, uh, coming from Airbnb. Today we are going to give a talk about a canonical of um, Airbnb's architecture. So the presentation is going to be given by uh, me uh, and also Leon. Uh, we both coming from a production infrastructure team coming from Airbnb. A little bit about us. Cool, let's start. For those of you who didn't know Airbnb, um, Airbnb start as a platform for hosts and guests to meet. Um, hosts can rent out their spare room uh, to guests. And this was uh, um, the product looked like more than five years ago. Um, you can search by different times. It will show you the map and will show you the listing. Um, in the past few years, the product has evolved from a single product homes into a multi-product line. So right now we're supporting homes, experiences, restaurants, and also what we call Beyond by Airbnb, which is a more luxury brand of the list itself. Um, in this talk, we're going to go over the infrastructure work that we did to enable such uh, product evolutions in the past few years. So this is the agenda today. We're basically going to go over the work we did in different years. And every single year, there is a themes. Um, and in the end, we're going to list it, uh, the current infrastructure challenges we have and to have a little bit of looking forward about the work we do. So in 2015, um, this is a year where we called human as an infrastructure. Uh, I would like to quote a very famous incident back in Airbnb at the time, um, what we called A24 incident. Um, it was a random day um, in April 2015, and the website was, was done. The databases were running 100% CPU usages. Uh, there was like no request being served to user. Um, and the incident actually happens on 24 minutes on the hourly basis. Um, and it took us 10 days to figure out the root cause, uh, which turned out to be uh, a cron job. We didn't know where the cron jobs actually deleted uh, a memcache key. Uh, the value was read by thousands of web servers. And all the web server is going to read a value if the value was not exist. And all of them is going to recompute re the value, which is quite expensive, um, and populate the value. And this cron job was run on 24 minutes on an hourly basis. And we actually have engineers to stand by on the 24 minutes of every, sing every single hour to making sure the website is not done. If the website is done, um, the engineer is going to turn off the entire traffic uh, and waiting for the system to recover. Um, and there was like a, quite a lot of human work at that specific time. Um, it was a pretty bad year for us. Um, so in that specific year, um, before we go into the detail, uh, we're going to take a look at the architecture at that side, uh, at that time. Uh, we're mostly running on a monolith ar architecture at that time. Um, the entire Airbnb infrastructure is running in Amazon. We're running a single region, uh, US East one. Uh, we're running a bunch of EC2 instances. Uh, we're running databases on RDS Aurora. Uh, RDS, uh, RDS MySQL at that time. Now we're running on Aurora. And we choose Ruby on Rails as the web, uh, the web server. And uh, let's take a look at the architecture from the very top to the very bottom. Uh, from the very top, we're supporting multiple different clients in the, here that we have uh, both desktop and, and also mobile. So the traffic going, going to hit CDNs, uh, CDN actually forward into our internal load balancer, which is built on top of Nginx. Then forward into our web server. Um, web server is written on Ruby on Rails, which has lots of business logics. Um, and in order to serve a pages, the web server is going to talk into databases through Active Record, which is a component provided by Ruby on Rails. And in addition, we have built many services in the past few years, including search, the pricing information, the listing availability, um, and our web tier is going to talking to them through a standardized uh, service client. So there are a lot of challenges associated with this simple architecture. Uh, the first challenge is, is the business logic is uh, very complicated. Uh, so here I give two examples. Um, first example is the number of databases table that uh, a page we call P3 serves. P3 is a, pages, uh, is a page which shows the detailed information of a listing. Um, such a simple page is actually talking to what we call 19 core tables and over 70 tables according to different databases. 
um, the pages needs to actually uh, looking for the title, the descriptions of the listings, and also reviews, uh, pricing information, availability information of the listing itself. Um, then uh, the things even make the things even worse going to a, a page called P4, which is the page for people to actually confirm their checkout. Um, that specific page is actually dealing with a lot of the payments related information. So that talking to 150 tables and over 200 tables across in all different databases. So the business logic is fairly complicated to us. The second challenge is, is traffic growth. So this is uh, the traffic growth coming from, uh, from 2013 to 2015. You can see the traffic actually um, increase almost double on, on a yearly basis during that period of time. And uh, so the traffic patterns is uh, usually in 2015, January, in the end of January, the traffic actually surpassed the peak traffic in 2014. And every single week afterwards is the new, new peak high for us. So you would imagine that it's actually fairly hard to operate in um, a website which the traffic grows like this trip. So when the traffic grows, um, the first challenges we have saw is the database is not quite stable. Um, this is a graph. Uh, which shows when such a database is going to happen, like what, what, what happens on our side. So we see uh, on the MySQL side, the threads running keeps spiking. Uh, we are, at that particular time, we are having about 30% of the error rate from the client side. And even for the requests which actually passed through, 60% of the requests passed through, um, the latency was significantly higher than before. So from the user perspective, during that period of time, the website is pretty much done. And we did a mass in the entire 2015. Our website is probably down for uh, hundreds of hours, and there are like about a um, couple of incidents happens on every single day. So because of that, we uh, form a special team which started tackling those uh, database scalability problems in 2015. So this is what we do. So the first thing we did is try to improve the visibilities in the, into the databases here. Uh, we did this both on the client side and on the server side. So on the server side, we started using MySQL's performance schema to be able to understand when a regression happens, um, which table it comes from, is it read or write, and which specific query pattern. So in addition to that, we also started logging information on the client side. So we started logging where does SQL query come from, which web handler, and even like what lines of code. So this actually enables us to be able to de detect regression very quickly and also be able to tell if a regression happens, which specific Git changes cause that, change, uh, cause that regressions. So this helps a lot for us to catch in those really large regressions. The second thing we start, do start doing is we try to improve uh, try to be able to measure the database's headroom and be able to improve it. So uh, for those of you who are interested, I have uh, a small talk back in 2016 reInvent about the specific topic. Uh, so the idea is um, first try to start measuring the database's headroom. We were able to do so because we run master-slave uh, RDS topologies. So we started replaying more than one of database's replica traffic on single databases. So we'd be able to um, stress test the databases from 100% to 600% of, uh, of, 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 of the traffic to be able to measure how much hydrogen it has. After being able to measure it, we start a series of projects trying to improve the database's hydrogen. Um, things like we started pulling out tables into, uh, started pulling out tables out of the main databases to run separately. We started doing databases caching uh, to save uh, the really simple queries. And both of them actually being able to improve in hydro more than 50%. The third thing we start running into is we start running into databases connection limitations. Um, every single of web servers keep a connection pool to our main databases. Um, at 2015, we talked to the main databases directly. And after we adding more and more web server, we start seeing the databases running on the max connection limit which actually prevent us from keeping adding web server. Um, this is a less desirable situation if your traffic is ever increasing. Um, we started working on 
I started using, uh, started hacking on uh, open source project called Mexico. Um, we enhanced, uh, we forked the version, we added a lot of features into it, including uh, connection pooling, query sorting, and back pressures and blacklist. So we use the max scale as a dropping replacement between the web servers and the databases. Um, and after we deploy that, we're able to scale our web tier uh, linearly. This is a graph showing the number of web servers we have. And this just shows that after we, um, after we drop in the max scale, we were able to add in uh, our web tier, the EC2 host, linearly over time. So after we did all of that, um, the traffic still keep increasing in 2016, um, but we were able to um, pass, the pass the 2016 in a much safer way. This is some stats. Um, after we did all of that, the number of databases incident dropped significantly to, from 15 to two. Uh, we have much less hard downtime, and the, the downtime hours was reducing from 100 hours to less than three hours. Um, so all of these works actually enable us to um, start building more forward-looking infrastructure, infrastructure project. So this starts 2016. After we solving the scaling challenges on the traffic side, we started seeing challenges on the scaling in terms of number of engineers. The first thing we started running into is the deployment of our monolithic code bases. Um, in order to explain that, I have to explain a little bit on our, on our release protocol. So we use a very simple release protocol. All the engineers, at that time, all the engineers working on a single repository, and, and they all commit to a single branches, master branches. And we release this, uh, we release this code base multiple times a day. So assuming we have 500 engineers, about 200 commits was, 200 commits was going to the repository on it every single day. If we release four or five times a day, there will be 40 to 50 changes to be batched, to be released. And we realized that even with a really low uh, bug density, let's say one or 2% of PR is gonna be reverted, if you're batching 40 or 50 of them, and it's gonna be troublesome, almost every single batch is gonna be reverted. Um, when that happens, so because we anticipate there's gonna be some changes gonna be reverted, we're actually asking all the engineer uh, the participants, so all the committers doing that batch to be standby while we're doing release. Um, so there will be like some engineer doing the coordinations. Um, and we realize when a revert is needed, it takes significantly more time for the changes to go, go out. This, this number shows about 5% of the release, which incurs about more than one and a half hours of delay. So during this one and a half of hours, those like 20 or 30 engineers are going to be standby just in case their change is going to be reverted. When, there are, there are, when such a debugging or bisecting is happening, we actually lock the deploy to, be, to prevent more changes to going into our system. We did a mass about there's like 15 hours uh, of time and we're going to lock the deploy so nobody can commit to the trunk. So this is actually pretty troublesome. About two out of, two out of five days, in a daily week, we're going to lock our entire deploy. So this, is a, this become, the engineer productivity becomes a really big problem. In addition to this, also associated with some other challenges, things like the lack of ownership, we started exploring service-oriented architectures. In 2016, we don't exactly know what do we need to build to enable uh, SOA, so we started doing some infrastructure support. So the first thing we started doing is we started, doing using, uh, started building a message bus to decouple um, different, different services, the communication between different services. A good example in this is uh, we have two services. One is like listing, the other is search. So consider a user change the pricing availability of a listing, and such information needs to be passed into our search services asynchronously so that search can so when a user search in our pages, they always get, get the latest updated um, pricing and availability information. So we started building out a message bus and to let um, services to publish standardized messages into it and also allow other services to listen, subscribe and listen to these services to get the information they want. 
The second thing we start building out is the dynamic configuration and distribution. Um, before we build out that, we kind of realizing the engineer was hacking a lot of different ways to pushing their configurations out. Some engineers just changing uh, the code to do a code pushes. Some, some engineers started using Redis. Some engineers started using Chef um, to, to modify a configuration changes. Some of these masters have like problems, things like if you do a code changes or Chef converge, for a big services has hundreds of machines, it usually take um, dozens of minutes, 20 minutes to be able to push out the entire fleet, which is less desirable in certain ways. So we started building out a dynamic configuration distribution systems, which using Zookeeper as the, uh, as, as, as the mechanic, and the client is able to listen to these, these, these changes. So we've been able to reduce the propagation delay from tens of minutes to tens of seconds. And now this become a very critical component where people started using this to, do, to enable and disable features to be able to do experiment and roll out, things like that. So the third is, uh, we started working on a new data store which support rapid product iteration. Uh, the best example I can give here is, um, we worked on a project in early 2016 where uh, in one of our databases tables, we actually stores the pricing information of a listing. And very unfortunately, that, that columns was actually locked as integers instead of a numeric value. Um, so we can only charge people up to dollars. So if it's like $100.50, we are not able to charge in the 50 cents. Um, so to be able to enable the product to, um, to be able to charge the, the, the cents, we need to add in a columns into the, into the table. But unfortunately, the table itself is like hundreds of um, gigabytes, which uh, do an online schema changes, which usually take like weeks to do so. Um, so we kind of realizing that we need to building, we need to have better data store support to be able to support rapid product iterations. So a very common product requirements is I want to be able to add in columns into these databases, some databases tables to be able to do experimentation. Some sometimes the business, uh, the, the the product team is not able to even understand if such column is, being, is going to be useful in the long term. They just want to try to see if it worked or not. So the first change we'll start doing is the mutation events propagation. This is actually very similar to the message bus, where uh, in this case is uh, the source services is like databases. We want to be able to populate databases mutation changes to the downstream services. Um, so before that, we actually just letting the services reading MySQL bin log directly, but MySQL bin log is like a very MySQL specific format, which is not very user friendly to downstream customers. So the first version we did is we, uh, we actually parsing the MySQL bin log format and actually publish uh, a platform neutral format using JSON or Swift so that the downstream customer can very easily consume it. And over the time, we kind of enhanced the features to support more data store and right now. Um, such such features not only applies to MySQL, but also applies to DynamoDB. So the downstream services shouldn't be aware of if the upstream data store is like MySQL or DynamoDB. Then the last is like we started in enabling uh, developing for Java services. Um, we have been a Ruby shop for many, many years. There are like many different libraries. Ruby have very extensive libraries to talk into all downstream, um, all downstream services, or like data stores, experimentation framework. Um, but Java, there are like many features, like not there in Java. So we started building out, making sure that Java and Ruby are feature parities within our companies, both in terms of the number of libraries, number of monitoring, and things like that. So in the end of that, we started working out routing queries from databases to services. So why we, uh, we use Active Record to talk, uh, to talk from the Ruby to the databases. Um, so there are like some tables, for instance, like listing tables. We want to make it a service, a listing services. So however, capture all the traffic from the Ruby tier to uh, the, 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 the services is, is pretty hard. So we started building out Active Record adapters, which still allows the engineer to write in the old Ruby query but the adapter is very clever enough to be able to route certain queries to a services instead of databases table. This actually make it really easy to porting like one databases table to what we call a core model services. This ends the 2016, 
Now I'm going to hand over to my coworker, Leon, and talk about the work we did in six, 17 and 18. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, at the beginning of the 2017, so at the infra side, you know, we very strongly believe uh, a service-oriented architecture is what we really need to build to unlock like a fast product development. But on the other hand, you know, a product engineer, uh, you know, they were still very hesitant to build services, and uh, they actually have a very good reason. So this is a, like a dependency graph of uh, different configurations. An engineer needs to create or maintain when they build a new service. So this is very easy to get out of sync, right? So, and also, you know, to some engineer who has worked at Airbnb for a long time, this probably is not a problem, but for somebody new, you know, this is like a puzzle, right? So, and so for, because of this, you know, it's easy, easily took like probably two weeks for somebody to spin up a new service. And uh, this was really a pinpoint, you know, for our product engineers. And so in 2017, you know, we started building this thing called one-touch service migration, uh, con configuration management. So basically, uh, we, uh, we, we, we built up this framework to allow developers to maintain their different configurations you know, in the same repository together with their project source code, right? So, so the configuration includes uh, secrets, uh, your deployable app, uh, your alerts you know, file. So basically, you know, everything you used to do in different repository, in Chef, uh, you know, in deployable app, in alerts repository, now you can do all of them together in the same position, uh, in the same, uh, same directory where your source code is, right? So with this, you, you can not only update you know, your configuration with your code, you can also deploy them together. So with this, you know, we kind of achieve this you know, uh, immutable infrastructure. So you can you know, always you know, safely roll forward and roll back uh, the same service image, which has the same configuration, same source code. And this uh, actually helped us save you know, probably like two weeks you know, in creating a new service. And also, you know, once you start a new service, right, so you need to implement the business logic. But you know, in a service-oriented architecture, so you don't just have business logic, right? So you need the entire inter-service communication. So basically, look at this diagram. So besides your basic business logic, you need to build a lot of other things, like a transport, right? So how the other service talk to your service. And uh, so basically, you need to provide the clients in both Java and Ruby. And uh, server side, you need to uh, I mean, you know, service you know, metrics uh, so that you can do the monitoring properly. And with the metrics, you can you know, create your own dashboard. Then from there, you can also create an alerts file so that you can be uh, you know, notified when some outage happened to your service. And uh, at the client side, on the server side, you also need to uh, building like basically resilience patterns, right? So retry, you know, circuit breaking, you know, timeout, these kind of things. But the problem is, you know, this all took time, right? So uh, engineers, you know, they basically, uh, instead of spending their time building on their core business logic so that you can, they can launch into production soon, so they have to spend a lot of time you know, doing all this plumbing work. So then we thought, you know, what about this, right? So what if you can just use uh, some standard, you know, service, you know, inter interface definition language like Thrift to define your service API? So basically, your data schema and your service interface methods. Then from that IDL file, we can generate a code for you. So basically, you just create your service IDL file. Then from the framework, we can give you all of this, right? So basically, uh, from the IDL file, we generate server-side code, which provides you know, standardized you know, server met uh, metrics. We give you like a, a validation of your request and response schema. So we provide you know, like a standardized you know, um, transport based on Thrift instead of JSON, because everything in the past was JSON over HTTP. But now with this, we actually support Thrift over HTTP. And uh, on the client side, we give you both Java and Ruby client, and they all uh, basically doing the same you know, best practice you know, in terms of metrics, in terms of a resilience feature in your client. 
and also basically uh, doing the, the same, you know, thrift, serialization and deserialization. So everything just comes here for free, right? So, and so with this, you know, we see that, you know, um, a team can actually, you know, launch a new service, you know, in probably within three, three weeks. So this is like a, like a significant improvement uh, compared to before. So uh, we very conservatively estimate that, you know, this body of work actually can save, you know, two to three weeks of development time. And uh, I think this, you know, is pretty obvious, you know, today in Airbnb, you know, uh, seeing the number of new services, you know, creating every day, launch into production every day. And uh, also, you know, with all the services, you know, in the distributed service architecture, you know, debugging becomes a problem, right? So this is much, much harder than before, you know, when everything is just in monorail, right? So, and so, and it's also very important to understand, you know, the lifetime of a request across all the services, you know, until a response was returned. And so uh, our, observability, uh, our observability team started working on the distributed tracing, uh, which basically uh, seamlessly in integrated into our service framework, right? So for both Java and Ruby. So, and all this, you know, just come for free. You know, you don't have to do any, anything extra. And this became very handy, you know, when it comes to debugging, uh, you know, problem, uh, also understanding performance bottleneck. And besides the, you know, service framework, right? So there are a bunch of other, like middleware services, we call them, you know, basically to support the lifetime of a request outside Mon Monorail. You know, in Monorail, you have everything, right? So that was why product engineer wanted to develop in Monorail, because, you know, they don't have to worry about a session, you know, user authentication, all this thing, right? So, but when they do services outside of Monorail, they have to think about all this, you know, but of course, you know, from the infra side, we just need to provide all this, you know, out of the box for them, right? So then all the different teams, you know, in infrastructure organization started working on all this, you know, global middleware services, you know, from user authentication to session data, user session data management, uh, to translation and uh, security and the risk check, uh, permission control, and uh, also media support, right? So, and eventually, so response data, content moderation, scrubbing, this kind of thing. So basically, the entire life cycle of a request can be supported outside, monitored through all these global middleware services. So by the end of uh, 2017, so uh, we were very happy to see the number of services uh, you know, already launched into production. So beginning of 2018, right? So we already have like a two major uh, API services, you know, launched into production and actually handling some of the a small percentage of tra uh, production traffic. So why is the home's PDP? Uh, PDP stands for product detail page. So which is basically the page you see about the detail of a listing. So the, that services are already launched, you know, basically built on top of this, you know, service framework. And also the other one is the P2 Explorer service. Um, so both are like probably the two of the you know highest you know throughput you know API services at Airbnb at the time. And but at the time you know the traffic was still routed through Monorail for some practical reasons. And uh, so the next thing we started building is API service framework. Uh, the reason is just because you know to be able to serve request outside Monorail, so you need to do a lot of other things. For example, security policy check. So like uh, to verify that a user is allowed to request, to visit, to view the data of a listing, so you need to do a bunch of uh, policy checks. And also for, to return a response, you need to do scrubbing. You need to remove all the sensitive, sensitive you know, PI data, right? So, and all this thing is must do. But, you know, in Monorail, everything was already integrated, right? So you don't have to worry about it. But in API service, you have to do that, right? So, but still, you know, we need to audit all these services. You are doing all the policy check. And it was just not easy to do, you know, if we do not have a framework to support that. So beginning of the 2018, we started working on this, you know, API service framework. It's basically still, you know, built on top of the service IDL. So basically, for every endpoint method, 
you can annotate you know, how you want to do your policy check, how you want to do response grabbing, right? So you can just tell the framework what code to call. And we generate the code to actually uh, to call those you know, scrapping surveys, to call those policy check services on behalf of your service. And it's also very easy for security team to audit every public facing API endpoints are performing all these necessary checks. And uh, so this you know, really uh, speed up you know, the launching of a public, public facing you know, services. So from Merlin, from the home's PDP, to the checkout, to list your space, manage your space, uh, to, uh, you know, to the explore, right? So today, we already probably have 20, 20 or 30 public-facing API services you know, in production traffic. And uh, so the framework you know, we build you know, from the infra side you know, really helped a lot. And the other thing is routing traffic, right? So, uh, you know, in, back in you know, 2017, we still relied on Monorail pretty much as the API layer. So the other API requests still routed through Monorail before they landed into one of the API services. So uh, we started this work you know, back in 2017. So basically a Java-based API gateway, so which provide, you know, provides not only just routing, right? So basically it also you know, talks to all these you know, global middleware services to collect session data, performing user authentication, uh, you know, translation, you know, whenever it's necessary. So also, you know, generate all these requests, contextual data. You know, uh, you need to propagate along with your request to all the downstream services. So today, so we already launched API Gateway to uh, probably 10 to 12, you know, API services. So already serving probably 20% of production traffic today. And we are also you know, onboarding you know, new services you know, every day today. So this is what you know, the current architecture looks like. So this is you know, Home's PDB, right? So our P3 service. So the request still comes through the Chiron load balancer. So uh, after that, you, you can see uh, something called a Hyperloop. So this is a Node.js cluster performing server-side rendering. And uh, through there, so the request will land into the uh, API gateway, right? So API gateway will perform all the necessary checks for you, collect all the necessary data for you, and pass along to the correct API service. So in this case, it's the home P3 service. So from P3 service, you know, it's uh, running on top of the API service framework, right? So the security policy check will be performed on behalf of that so you don't have to do anything. And so from there, the request will be fanned out to data services or derived data services. You know, then data service will talk to uh, database or other derived data store. So this is, you know, so you, you, uh, uh, if you remember what Xinyao showed earlier, so this is very different from the monolithic architecture um, like three years ago, right? So now the question is, does SOA really help, right? So, uh, in terms of performance, so when we launched P3 service, which is the home's PDP, so basically we saw a latency improvement by 10x. So basically a drop from 1,200 milliseconds to just 220 milliseconds. And also the Explore service you know, had a 2.5x performance improvement, and the pricing service had a you know, 3x performance improvement. Availability, right? So the single page service basically has very good isolation, right? So it does not rely on monitor anymore. So the availability improve, you know, you can, you can improve, you, you can have improved availability just because you no longer rely on talking to monorail, right? And also consistency. So for example, our pricing service now has the centralized pricing logic. So in the past, the pricing information was scattered across different pages. So you could say different price for the same listing you know, when, you, uh, when, you, when you book your request, right? So when you book your listing. So with the centralized services, you know, we have this you know, very good consistency for different things. And uh, so altogether, you know, the service architecture you know, really help with fast product iteration, right? So, so now, like, uh, we, have, you know, we, have, we have different businesses now, right? So we have homes, we have experience, we have China you know, business units, we have like a selects, uh, 
So restaurants, right? So and we see you know, very fast you know, product development and launching across all the different business units, right? So together, so the service platform we are building really helps enable uh, a Airbnb platform, which is basically not just a home's rental marketplace, it's actually an end-to-end -end trips platform. And of course, you know, with the change, with the shift from you know, a monolithic architecture to a microservices architecture, right? So we start to say new or different you know, infrastructure challenge. So basically, with SOA, with the growing number of services, everything, a lot of things changed, right? So the traffic pattern changed, the data loading pattern changed, and the number of uh, services, you know, thing you put onto Zookeeper increased a lot, right? So we started seeing different, different scalability and reliability issue pretty much across you know, our technical stack. So for example, service discovery, right? So at Airbnb, we have this thing called a smart stack, which is our uh, in-house built you know, service discovery stack. Uh, so Zookeeper sits at the heart of our service discovery stack, right? So and with the uh, increasing number of services dependency in monorail, right? So we started seeing a lot of problems with uh, Zookeeper. And uh, this is just because you know, we are still in the middle of SOA migration. So it means you know, we are migrating all the 200 something API endpoints out of monorail to services. But still, we still have to you know, add all this dependency to monorail today, right? So then that number grows you know, every day. So on monorail side, you, know, you just see, you, know, you, you start seeing different problems, you know, talking to Zookeeper. So basically the number of uh, uh, watch counts increased, right? So connection increased. And uh, so also operating Zookeeper is always a painful, painful thing. And uh, so oftentimes, you know, Zookeeper stability issue cause service downtime or even site downtime. And the other thing, the other component in our service discovery is actually proxy, right? So actually proxy has this thing called graceful config restart, which basically means you, know, you need to restart a new actually proxy instance when you have configuration change. And in the past, you know, when the service topology is simple, this works perfect, right? So, and, uh, but now when you have 200 something dependency in monorail, this could be just a nightmare, right? So this you know, screenshot is from some earlier this year. So when we had some problem with our service discovery stack, right? so you can see that the number of uh, HA proxy instances increased to 30 something at a moment, just because there were constant flapping of backend services you know, to monorail. Right? So, and this caused a lot of scalability issue to us. So we did our share of firefighting earlier this year. But now we are basically uh, launching an envoy, envoy uh, to replace IJ proxy in your service discovery stack. And envoy is just more modern, you know, technology compared to IJ proxy, and it also has you know a lot of nice feature we can leverage for our service mesh. Uh, also, the number of uh, EC2 instances we are handling, we are operating, maintaining today, uh, has grown a lot, right? So, and uh, this caused a lot of operation load issue to us. Because, you know, for example, you know, every time when AWS asks us to upgrade our operating system, right? So we basically need to restart all the services across the entire stack. It, is, it was a painful operation to us, right? And also the other thing, right? So, uh, you know, uh, we are facing this, you know, staggering number of uh, EC2 instances, right? So what are we gonna do, right? So if we spend all our time on doing this kind of infra operation, we will have no time to building the other infrastructure technology which are necessary, required for the new SOA, right? So today, you know, as an alternative, we are looking at you know, building uh, Kubernetes uh, through our entire stack. So also the message bus, right? So, I mean, this is very interesting, right? So you, know, you can see that you know, the jump of number of message ingestion in our Kafka-based message base, you know, message bus. It's just jumped you know, through from the time we started building services in summer you know, 2017, right? So, and the number of partitions, number of topics all just increased significantly. 
And all this, you know, same thing, you know, so we have a very small, like a, uh, you know, Kafka team, only two engineers, right? So we do not have the kind of benefits to handle all this. So for this part, we are actively looking at um, Amazon, you know, uh, Kinesis to, as a replacement, right? So basically, you know, like, uh, this is what we have done in the last four years. You know, basically back in 2015, our time were firefighting for site stability. 2016, we had some time uh, to thinking about, you know, what kind of foundational thing we should work, we should build, right? So 2017, we think, we, we, we knew, you know, SOA makes sense for us, right? So we started building the service framework, the service platform to allow people to build services fast and also in the best possible way. So 2018, basically, as the company policy, you know, as company priority, we know, you know, we need to double down on SOA, right? So a lot of work are happening today. So this is what we uh, went through as a journey uh, for architecture evolution. And in terms of lessons, right, so we think, you know, SOA, you know, is one way to scale not only your traffic growth and also organization growth. So in terms of organization growth, this is basically matching uh, what Conway's law is about, right? And uh, secondly, you know, like uh, a lot of the infrastructure problem, we found out kind of late. So when we started building all the services, right? So uh, it would be better if we foresee this problem, right? So we can build beforehand, right? Which is something, you know, we are doing now. So like modernize our service mesh, modernize our data store to basically, you know, uh, work better with, you know, the, the future, you know, traffic growth with the service, you know, oriented architecture. And this is, this is it. So uh, now, you know, we can either open it to questions or... Yeah, uh, I think we will, we will be there and after this and, uh, like, very happy to discuss with all of you if you have any questions about this. Thanks, thanks everyone for attending. Yeah, thank you.